Uh, and I want to welcome everybody who's joining us via Zoom. So I don't get to see you. Um, I hope that you'll feel free to put questions or comments on chat, but I won't be able to get to them until the very end of the uh, presentation. And I just warn you, there's a lot of material I'm going to be covering. So I hope we'll have room to do that. And also, those of you who are in the room with me, you're welcome also to ask questions or make comments as we go along. If you want to interrupt, you can always you know, raise your hand and, and say something. Um, or you can hold your questions and comments to the very end, like the people who are on Zoom. But anyway, I just briefly going to introduce myself. I'm Robert Bunkin. I'm a painter, a figurative painter, and I've been giving these talks at this library now for about three years, I think. And I also give talks at Greenwich House, two chapters of Greenwich House. Uh, usually they're on Wednesdays uh, at uh, Greenwich House, Washington Square. I, we meet usually at from 1030 to 12 and they give free lunch. So if that's of interest to anybody. And, and then um, I also give the same talk later the same day on Wednesday uh, from 2.30 to 4 at Greenwich House in West Beth, which is also where I live. So um, those, of course, those are really geared for senior citizens. So I think if you're 62 or older, you could become a member of Greenwich House. It's free and you can attend those and they have a lot of other interesting programs going on. Um, but uh, just to give you a little background in the kinds of art I like to talk about, uh, these topics are really not any kind of, there's no specific program going on in that I don't, I'm not trying to present an overview of art history or a specific genre of art. Uh, they're motivated purely from my own personal interest. And uh, in the case of this, topic. One day I was just thinking of, about the fact that there's a lot of art that deals with laundry. And I thought, I think that would be an interesting topic to talk about. In the past, I've talked about sinks in art because there's um, a lot of imagery that has to do with sinks or basins and washing. Um, so in a way, this is connected to that. Um, and then, you know, many, many other topics which I've talked about, which are largely, I feel, rather ignored by most art historians. And the bulk of art history talks don't usually cover the material that I like to cover. So, um, so that's really what motivates me. Anyway, so that's just a brief introduction, and I'm going to move on. Um, so I'm um, starting this talk with... Dutch 17th century painting. And um, I was aware of the fact that there are a lot of uh, uh, landscape paintings that represented bleaching fields. So some of the work you're gonna see now are these bleaching fields, which was part of the process of laundry. Partly the bleaching was probably done commercially to bleach new textiles to make them white and the textiles would have been primarily made of linen. Um, and this is a very famous uh, landscape painting by one of the great Dutch 17th century, 17th, I said 17th, one of the great Dutch 17th century landscapists, uh, Jacob van Roysdael. And he was based in the city of Harlem, which is not very far from Amsterdam. Uh, but it had its own economy and sort of a, a kind of self-contained city. Um, and it's a view of Harlem with the bleaching grounds. And if you look carefully, uh, you'll see that there are these little white patches on the fields in the foreground of the painting. Um, but what takes up most of this painting is the sky. And that was very innovative. I mean, that was like, a, 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 I hesitate to call it revolutionary, but it was a very innovative idea in landscape painting. Landscape painting as an independent genre, apart from telling any kind of say biblical or hyster historical narrative was a relatively new thing. And the Dutch really um, pushed that and expanded it a lot in this in the 17th century. And Roysdale certainly was one of the um, most innovative and most um, 
gifted landscape painters. So um, these are a few other Dutch 17th century images that involve laundry and bleaching. Um, so two paintings uh, on the upper uh, left and right by Peter de Hoek, who was a contemporary of Vermeer. Uh, he also painted a lot of genre scenes, both interiors and exterior genre scenes. Uh, his work is a little bit more varied than Vermeer. You know, Vermeer mostly painted interior scenes, um, although I think Vermeer was a slightly superior painter to de Hoek. That's my personal opinion. Uh, but uh, de Hoek produced some very interesting paintings. And these two um, obviously, you know, focus on bleaching. And uh, one of the things I learned in doing research for this presentation was something about the process of bleaching. So obviously laying the uh, textiles out in the sunlight was part of the bleaching process, but that wasn't the only thing that made the uh, textiles whiter. They also used um, natural materials like um, dung, you know, manure was part of the process of, I don't know what the chemistry of that was, but they use manure. And in the painting on the left, you see a big vat, which very likely is the vat where the cloth, the cloth would be soaked. And then there's a rectangular basin that three women are working at uh, closer to the foreground, which I believe is probably a rinsing process. So they're rinsing that material off of the fabric, and then they're spreading it out in the fields to uh, just bleach in the sun. You could also see uh, in that painting, there's a, a sort of a, um, it could have been used as a shop sign. I don't think it was, but it could have been because it shows many of the steps, if not all of the steps of preparing the cloth, laying it out in the field, and then uh, folding it and putting it on a wagon to say, bring it to a uh, seamstress or wherever, where it could be turned into a collar or cuffs or a shirt or whatever. Um, so the other painting by de Hoek on the upper right shows a woman and a child at a bleaching ground, which is probably a smaller, more private bleaching ground. And it's probably a mother and a daughter um, and the mother is uh, taking, again, the fabric out of a basin and spreading it out on the ground. Um, the painting below that is by another uh, Dutch painter, Peter Post. Um, and again, if you look carefully, you realize those white rectangles on the ground are not some kind of um, plant. It's fabric that's been spread out to bleach on the ground. And it's interesting to see that by the 19th century, when Van Gogh is active, also Dutch, um, that process of bleaching was still being used. So this is a, uh, a, a, a gouache and watercolor painting by Van Gogh uh, called Bleachery at Scheveningen. And Scheveningen is a town not far from The Hague where De, um, Van Gogh was living for about three years. Um, and Scheveningen is right near the beach. So this is on a beach. And um, it's the other side of another sketch. I don't know what's on the other side of it, but this is the recto side or the proper side of the piece of paper. Um, I'm actually reading or rereading uh, Van Gogh's letters to his brother Theo, and he's always talking about economizing because he was on a very, very strict allowance from his brother Theo at this time. And it makes sense that he would use both sides of a, an expensive piece of watercolor paper. Anyway, jumping back to the 17th century, um, another thing that the Dutch pioneered were the genre scenes and genre scenes often involved the activities of peasant class, and lower class urban people, uh, servants. Um, so this is a painting by Gabriel Metsu showing a washerwoman. Um, and this painting is gonna appear again 
Um, so I, I want you to remember what it looks like. What's interesting about the painting, besides the action of uh, that he's documenting of the woman um, washing cloth in a basin, is the the setting. So first of all, he's enclosed the figure in an illusionistic stone art archway or window, an arched window. And through that, we not only see her, but we also get a glimpse into the interior where she's working. There's a big fireplace behind her and what looks like the corner of a painting and maybe a chest and some other objects hanging on the wall. Uh, in the very foreground, there's a jug and some kind of bowl filled with some kind of material. I'm not quite sure what it is on a, on a what looks like a white napkin. Um, so we get some kind of insight into the household uh, in which this woman is working. And it's not likely that she's the owner of that household because that fireplace um, is very large and kind of luxurious. So she probably was a servant. So now we're moving ahead uh, chronologically into the 18th century. And this is a painting by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. So Fragonard represents a second generation of what's come to be known as Rococo painting. Uh, you know, generally 17th century painting is considered Baroque. And then uh, 18th century painting, especially in France, uh, was given this name Rococo. And we often think of Rococo as being a rather lightweight, often um, mildly titillating and erotic subject matter. Um, Fragonard did a lot of paintings like that. And even in this painting, which is about uh, laundry, you can see that the figures have a kind of almost childlike quality to them. This is very typical of the Rococo style. Um, so it's a rather mysterious painting and somewhat exceptional for Fragonard. I would call it a caprice or capriccio because it's, I think the setting is completely invented and capriccio paintings, it's, it's an Italian word, um, were very, um, very popular in the 18th century. Um, and usually they involve fictive situations. They could be romantic situations or they could be um, in settings that are uh, romantic, like in ruins or caves, or this is, doesn't look exactly like a cave because the arch is too perfect. It's not a natural arch, it's a man-made arch. And there's also that column and what looks like a built wall um, and there's some steps. Um, so it's, it's interesting that Fragonard made this painting of women doing laundry. You see a great big cauldron with a fire under it where they're boiling water to clean the clothes in it. Um, and then there's a, what looks like a half naked uh, male figure in the foreground with a dog and an infant. So it's a little hard to tell exactly what's going on in this picture, but um, that's fairly typical of um, Rococo paintings. And there's another painting that I wanna share with you also from the same era, but by another artist, uh, Hubert Robert, a French artist who worked in Italy. And this again is a kind of capriccio painting because the setting of this painting um, is, uh, the ruins of a Roman bath, but I don't believe it represents an actual Roman bath. So he's taken, you know, he's, he, he was living in Rome and he was studying Roman ruins and uh, Roman architecture, but using them as settings for uh, contemporary activities. So you see women, you know, busily washing clothing in this uh, basin, that probably was meant to be, um, you know, reminiscent of the grandeur of ancient Rome and the ruins, which are very extensive in the painting. It includes statuary, um, you know, these very impressive columns, art, a series of arches, and uh, also some relief sculpture on the walls. It seems like there's like there's like an angel or flying figure. Uh, in relief on one of the walls. So all kinds of um, reminiscences 
of ancient Rome and its former grandeur, but this very mundane activity is taking place there in a place that we can imagine must have been really quite amazing when it was actually built and being used by the ancient Romans. It's also interesting that there's a, there's a gondola in the water. So again, we're in the 18th century and these are two uh, contemporary artists, although Bruz, you can see from his dates, was a younger artist than Jean Simeon Chardin. So Chardin is primarily known as a still life painter. And still life was the lowest genre in the hierarchy of genres according to the French Academy. Um, however, Chardin was very, very acknowledged in his lifetime. Uh, Diderot, Denis Diderot wrote very glowingly of his work. He called him a magician. Um, Diderot, you know, was one of the encyclopedists. He's the author of one, one of the first encyclopedias. And uh, he was also an art critic. And Chardin uh, had a certain prestige uh, as his career went on. Uh, because he was elected to be the person in charge of the, the design and installation of the annual Salon exhibitions. And that carried a lot of weight because Chardin then could decide if your work is going to be hung way up high, uh, you know, so that it couldn't be seen well or too low or they, what they called on the line, which was like the choice hanging on, you know, kind of on eye level. Um, so the people who were in favor usually got to hang on the line, but the people who were maybe younger artists or artists for whatever reason that were out of favor would be skied or hung too low. And it was really up to Chardin to do that. And apparently he did a very good job and he was very respected for it. And he tried to be very fair. Um, so in the 1730s, Chardin decided to expand the uh, material that he dealt with in his paintings, and he started to do a series of genre paintings, very much inspired by Dutch 17th century genre painters like De Hoop. Um, he might have known Vermeer, although Vermeer really wasn't very well known until the 19th century. Um, and you can see in this painting, um, the activities that are going on probably in the cellar of an upper class home, uh, so these are all servants. Even the boy is probably a servant or the child of a servant. And you see the young woman, at, again, at a basin, a wooden basin, uh, scrubbing some clothing. In the background through the, through the doorway, you see another serving woman who's hanging the laundry to dry on an indoor line. And then the little boy is blowing a bubble. And that theme, was taken up a lot by Chardin. It has nothing to do with laundry. It has more to do with the idea of the ephemeral, right? So there was a whole series of paintings that Chardin did, often of children playing different kinds of games that had to do with ephemera, like um, uh, playing, uh, making a house of cards that would collapse at any minute, or blowing bubbles, or um, uh, uh, flipping, um, a, a bone in the, uh, a ball playing uh, knuckle bones. Um, you know, so all these activities that had a kind of very, very instantaneous ephemeral quality. So this is one of the themes that Chardin started to take up when he was doing these genre paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these, these are genre, right? No, so these are not. Yeah, these were not considered portraits. Okay, so so portraits. Yeah. Right. No. Right. Paintings that focused on an individual, like say Napoleon. It was a little bit later, but paintings that not just famous people, but you know, and and Chardin did do some portraits. He did some very fine self portraits. He did a portrait of his wife. 
Um, he didn't do a lot of portraits, but he did do some portraits. And those would be images that are clearly representing a very specific individual, um, really focusing on their face more, not so much environment, right? And usually they're not active. They're usually posing, uh, standing or seated, but usually passive. Yeah, so that that's, yeah. Um, okay, so the other artist here is Jean-Baptiste Gruz, and Gruz usually had a kind of ulterior motive in a lot of these genre paintings that he did. Um, sometimes he would deal with uh, like vices and virtues. He really wanted to give an image of, let's say the virtuous uh, serving girl. So she would be the industrious one, like this young woman who's busy doing the laundry. But there's another painting by Bruce, for example, that shows a young woman who's fallen asleep, who's neglecting her duties. And that was really the context in which his work was often understood. So this painting is by an artist, an Italian artist who spent uh, about 36 years in the West Indies. And his work has gotten a lot of attention recently because uh, clearly he deals with um, racial issues in his work. Um, so what's interesting about this painting is all of the women are either African or mixed race. The woman who's standing in the center, whose pose resembles a lot Venus rising from the sea is the lightest skinned woman. And she seems to be given a kind of a privileged position in the painting. Although she's holding a paddle and below her is a rock with some um, laundry on it. So she too is doing laundry. Uh, she's sort of in the privileged position and the other darker skinned women are around her, um, you know, in the act of, of washing the clothing. So this is very indicative of the kind of uh, social and racial hierarchy that was existing in the West Indies when Brunius did his paintings. And a lot of his paintings focus on the lives of women. And you could see that they're, you know, dark skinned to light skinned. Rarely does he paint white women, but sometimes there are also white women there who are obviously, um, you know, colonial women. And uh, a younger contemporary of Brunius was Louis Leopold Boilly. Um, so I just thought this was a very charming painting. Boilly did a lot of, he did portraits, he did trompe l'oeil, which means uh, fool your eye paintings. So they were kind of illusionistic trick paintings. For example, he did a tabletop, um, an actual marble tabletop, but on the marble, he painted in oil, the illusion of coins and playing cards and little miniature portraits. Um, so that sort of thing, which was very popular in the, the 18th century and into the 19th century. And then he also did, um, small scale portraits and genre scenes like this young woman ironing. So this is a kind of my poster image for this talk. And I thought it was really kind of a, a, a kind of fascinating painting. Um, it's by an artist named Lily Martin Spencer. And uh, she was one of the first, um, not the first, but an early, 19th century successful female artist in America. Um, she was actually the breadwinner of her family. She was she did marry and have children, and she really made the money for you know to to raise the family. Um, and uh, also, I think what's interesting about this particular painting is it really shows what is essentially drudge work, because laundry really is, still is, even though we use machines now. I know my feeling is, oh, I gotta do laundry. Um, but anyway, uh, it, you know, and it was even more drudge work in the 19th century and before, you know, washing machines were um, available. So despite that, this woman looks very enthusiastic and very pleased that she's doing laundry. Um, you know, there are some innovations already here because she has a scrub board 
this corrugated scrub board in her wooden basin. Uh, the basin is not uh, bound by um, wooden hoops. It's bound by uh, metal hoops, uh, which is a little bit more durable. Um, but the painting, of course, I mentioned this at the, when I first showed this picture, was very much indebted to this painting by Metsu. So it's likely, I don't know this for an absolute fact, but the compositions are so similar. And the fact that the Spencer painting is uh, framed illusionistically, that's a trompe l'oeil. I don't think that's an actual frame, but that's painted to look like a gold frame, but it's also arched like the Metsu painting. So, uh, however, I would say the distinction here is likely that the woman in Lily Martin Spencer's painting is a housewife and she's doing her own laundry. She's not a servant where the figure in the Metsu painting probably was a servant. Um, I think she worked in New York. I think she was based in New York. Um, so now it was in the 19th century that laundresses on laundry became a major sort of subgenre of genre paintings, you know, genre paintings being scenes of everyday life. Um, and there was a lot of fascination with laundresses and with the character of uh, urban laundresses in particular. Um, and although these paintings predate it, there was a very famous best-selling novel by Emil Zola, who was a great realist uh, author, who made this uh, in, uh, really long series of novels that were interrelated because they dealt with about three different families. And one of the families, oops, uh, was a, um, and he, he, he wrote a lot about the, the Parisian working class. And the novel that I have in mind in particular was called La Samoir. And it was published first in serialized form in 1876. And then it came out as a novel the following year. So La Samoir is really about alcoholism and the effects of alcoholism on a working class family. But it focuses on the main character, a woman named Gervais, who, who is a laundress. And um, it's, so it's a lot about laundry. And there's a really great film that was made uh, in the 1950s based on this book. Um, and I think it's called Gervais. Um, sorry, I don't remember the exact title, but you can look it up. And it's, it's, a, gr it's, a, great, uh, it's a great film. And I think it's probably very faithful to the Zola novel. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the, the laundress uh, partly because in urban, you know, uh, Paris, laundresses were very um, ubiquitous. Um, their work was very hard, very poorly paid, and oftentimes they supplemented their income by being prostitutes. So there was also kind of this moral uh, view of women who did laundry that they were kind of women of loose morals. Um, but these artists, Millet and Daumier, were both very connected to the realist movement, and they were really trying to show the dignity and the uh, kind of um, difficulty of these women's lives. Um, so you have the washerwomen who are uh, peasant women washing clothing uh, at a riverside, and then this urban woman who apparently was based on a view that Daumier had outside his studio window. Uh, and he would see, you know, these characters through the window. Uh, and blanchisseuse is just a French word for uh, a laundress. So it's a, a, a woman with her child who's holding the paddle that she would use to uh, smack the clothing. Um, it was part of the process of cleaning the clothes. And uh, she's walking up steps that are leading from the Seine River, where very likely she was doing her laundry. And you can imagine that the Seine wasn't exactly an unpolluted river at that time either. So um, we're back with an American artist, Susan McDowell Aikens, 
Uh, you might be familiar with her husband, Thomas Aikens. Okay, so Thomas Aikens was an American realist painter. He had studied in Paris. He attended the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was the most prestigious school probably in Europe at the time for artists. And um, Susan McDowell Aikens was a student of Aikens when he taught at the Pennsylvania Academy of Art. Uh, he was a very controversial uh, teacher there and he ended up being asked to resign. Uh, that's another story, but it's very interesting that um, uh, Susan McDowell Aikens, his wife, um, chose to do this uh, sketch in preparation for a painting of a servant um, in, in their home, a woman named Rosanna Williams. Uh, however, I'm not aware that she actually executed a larger scale painting. So of course, when we think of laundresses and you think of art and laundresses, you think of Degas, or at least I would think you would. Um, and it so happens that the Cleveland Museum is going to be opening the first ever exhibition in uh, October of this year, uh, focusing on Degas' laundress paintings. So if you wanna go to Cleveland to see these in depth, there's your chance. I don't think that show's gonna come to New York, but I think it's, it sounds like a really interesting exhibition. And I didn't know that. I just found that out when I was preparing this presentation. So it's a, a, a kind of interesting coincidence. Um, so of course, Degas did many paintings, drawings and pastels. Uh, I, I don't know if he did too many prints because he was also a very pr uh, prolific printmaker uh, of laundresses. And Degas in general was very interested in the lives of working women. I think we have this misconception of the ballet pictures as having to do with the, the glamour and the elegance and grace of the ballet, where if you really look at them, you realize what Degas is depicting. First of all, mostly they're rehearsals. He almost never, with a few exceptions, he almost never represents actual performances. Um, and he's also dealing with the life of the uh, corpse de ballet, not the prima ballerinas. So like those were usually very young dancers, aspiring dancers. Um, they were called rats actually. Um, and again, like laundresses, they were considered available to men, you know? So um, there, there was that kind of um, sexual connotation as well as you know, the fact that these women work very, very hard uh, as ballerinas and as laundresses. And um, this was, as I said, a very low paying kind of work that women, you know, working class women did um, to supply men and women of the upper class and the middle class with, you know, uh, the clothing that they wore. People rarely, people of the middle to upper class almost never did their own laundry. They always relied on laundresses to do that. Yeah. What's sexual about it? What's sexual? Well, I said that a lot of times because laundresses were so poorly paid that they would supplement their income by being prostitutes. Because there weren't a lot of, you have to remember, there weren't a lot of opportunities for working class women to earn a living, but they had to. Otherwise, they would be living in dire poverty. So, and it, you know, the, that that novel by Zola really gives you a good picture of that. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, Gervais isn't a prostitute, but there's a, a lot of uh, like fighting over. She was living with a man out of wedlock, for example, which was considered very scandalous, but not uncommon especially amongst working class women. And uh, she has children, you know, and, um, you know, alcoholism becomes a problem. And then an, a, a former lover returns after she does marry. And, you know, so I don't want to go through that whole story, but there's a lot about sexuality in it. And it's, it's probably very indic indicative of what the lives of working class women were like in, in cities in the 19th century. 
And of course, Degas also did scenes from brothels. So he was very interested in the full gamut. Uh, milliners, you know, women who sold and made hats was another subject he did a lot of images of. And so he was really very interested in the lives of working women, much more so than men. Although he certainly painted men too. Um, so these are just some other examples. And you could see also the like theme and variation in Degas. He would reuse certain figures, uh, reclothe them, change the color relationships, uh, or change what they're working on. Uh, so you can see that the woman who's ironing is the, the, actually the two figures are identical here, but he's changed the clothing, uh, he's changed the resolution a little bit. One, the painting in uh, the Norton Simon Museum, which he started earlier and reworked, which is something that Duca did quite often with his work. Um, as he got older, also his eyesight got worse. He, had, he always had bad eyesight, but his eyesight deteriorated as he got older. Um, so the resolution in a lot of his later work is, is um, fuzzier, you know? not just because he's an impressionist, um, which he sort of wasn't exactly an impressionist, but um, it's also because he, he really couldn't see that well. Are those both pastels? Um, no, uh, I think both of these are oil paintings. Although, you know, he did do pastels as well. And as, as, his, uh, as he got older, he relied more on pastel because it was easier to manipulate than oil painting, especially with his vision being impaired. Yes, do you have a question? Oh, 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 oh okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the other thing that you could see in these paintings of laundresses is how boldly experimental Degas can get. So for example, the one that I have no title for um, and I don't know what the collection it's in, uh, probably it's in a private collection, um, but I couldn't find the label for it. That way of cropping is so innovative and unusual. Uh, and I'm assuming it was probably done in the 1880s. Uh, even for Degas, this is a very experimental, I'm talking about the painting on the left. Um, you know, it's a very bold uh, and interesting way of cropping the figure. And if you look at the face, there's almost no feature, it's like a featureless face. So, but you still get the feeling of the action and you know, you, you still know what, you can still read what's going on in the painting. And one of the boldest, most experimental paintings was this one, which is still in a private collection uh, from 1878. Uh, and it is signed and usually if a, artist puts a signature, uh, it indicates that he or she considered the work finished, although that's not always the case. And a lot of Degas paintings actually have estate stamps on them so that they were uh, stamped with his signature uh, after he died. And I, but I believe this to me looks like an actual signature, you know, done with a brush, not, not an estate stamp. Um, but it's very interesting the, the choreography of the two figures, you know, and of course he loved the dance and we all know his, his ballet paintings, but there's a sense of a choreography going on in the way the figures sort of um, rhyme with each other and they move within a very ambiguous space. What is that yellow? You know, is that a wall or, you know, the brown that seems to be invading the yellow and then there's this sort of white patch and I know we can see the white uh, in the baskets as the laundry that they're carrying, but um, you know it has this really kind of interesting non finito, but it's very interesting the way in which it's not finished. And of course, then I, I call it non finito, not unfinished. That that sense of the unfinished is something that became more and more prevalent in avant garde painting in the 19th and into the 20th century. So other artists who were dealing with aspects of laundry. Uh, so Eugene Boudin uh, was based in the city of La Havre and he was a kind of mentor to Claude Monet. And he advocated working outside, you know, plein air 
directly from the motif. And he was a very avid sketcher. So you can see in this slide, a sketch version of the laundresses on the beach from 1885, and then a slightly more resolved finished version of that. But I say slightly, because when you look at it, you realize it's still pretty sketchy. So Boudin really was a, an immediate predecessor to Impressionism. And then he was aware of the Impressionists and the Impressionists really admired his work. And he was in, in turn influenced by the Impressionists. So he sort of became an, more or less an Impressionist painter, um, but he was not from the same generation. He was from the generation before the Impressionists. And Berta Morisot who was a, uh, one of the uh, female Impressionists. She, she was one of the uh, painters who really participated in most of the independent exhibitions that were organized by the Impressionist group. You know, I'm talking about Claude Monet, Renoir, um, Morisot, uh, Degas, Cassatt, Mary Cassatt, um, and uh, Cicely, uh, Pizarro. Those were all part of that main group. So again, this is, uh, Morisot was uh, from an upper middle class family, and this would be representing a servant. And this is a, sort of a, a, a grand and rather classical looking uh, laundress that was done very late in Renoir's career. Um, again, most of us know Renoir as a painter, primarily, but as he got older and he was suffering very, from very severe arthritis, he also uh, tried his hand at some uh, sculpture. And he actually collaborated on this sculpture, although he's generally credited with being the, the designer of the sculpture. He collaborated on this particular sculpture with a Spanish sculptor named Richard Guino Bo Boix. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, forgive me if I mispronounce it. But um, Renoir called this La Grande Laveuse, and it was cast in different scales, but generally was cast a little larger than life size. And um, there are several versions of it. The Museum of Modern Art here in New York has a version, but I don't think it's on display now in the Sculpture Garden. Uh, it used to be. Um, so these are actually photographs from two different museums, because I, as sculpture, I wanted you to be able to see it at least from two different points of view. And the interesting thing here is that he sort of classicized the figure because she's nude. Generally, peasant women doing laundry did not do the laundry in the nude. So there's some peasant women washing in a, at a river, and that that's more like how they would have actually done the laundry. And these two paintings are both by Camille Pizarro, who is very, who is a socialist and very interested in the lives of working class and peasant men and women. So one, the washerwoman at Aranyi, who's working at the basin on the left. So that's a domestic servant probably working for you know, a middle-class family. And then the others are probably working as laundresses for, you know, an entire community. Or they could be doing their own laundry, but they're probably not. So the woman raising the paddle, that's a, you see that a lot, you know? Um, sometimes they had soap. Uh, I think the woman that's sort of crouching down in this sort of buff colored dress in the foreground, is, might be clutching a bar of soap. Uh, we saw soap in the painting by Lily Martin Spencer. Um, but sometimes they just uh, clobbered the dirt out of the clothing. <laughs> yeah, oh, sure, yeah. In India, they, they still, some women are still doing that, yeah. And different parts of Asia and Africa, you know, uh, people are still doing laundry like this. It's, it's not something that's obsolete. And you have to bear in mind how hard this labor is. It's not just the physical act of scrubbing the clothing, but the fact that they're kneeling for hours in a very damp environment 
the wear and tear on the body from doing this, you know, and, and the, the clobbering part, uh, you know, to, this is really hard work. You were going to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, with, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that, that's a long way, is to send your laundry, uh, if you're listening on Zoom and you didn't get that, this, I don't know what your name is, what's, uh, a, a person in the, uh, the live audience here said that the French aristocracy sent their laundry to the Caribbean. I'm sure they also had local laundresses too. I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, so this is Gauguin's, uh, uh, one of several uh, laundress paintings that Gauguin did. And, uh, you know, it really reflects a lot the influence of Japanese prints that he was looking at. And I'm going to actually show you some Japanese prints of laundresses um, in a minute. Uh, so uh, all contemporaries of uh, Gauguin, Van Gogh, the post-impressionist, Emile Bernard, who was actually a, uh, a sort of a disciple of Gauguin, although this is a little bit before he really worked closely with Gauguin, and he also knew Van Gogh quite well. They had a, um, a correspondence with, with each other. Uh, and Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, who is also a friend of um, Van Gogh's when he was living in Paris. So this is what I was talking about. So these are part of a genre of prints that are known as ukiyo-e prints, prints of the floating world. <clears throat> and what was meant by this term, the floating world? Initially, it was connected to ideas of Zen, but it became in the, I would say, uh, in the latter part of the 17th century, the 1600s, um, when most of the prints were done just in black and white, uh, it became associated with the pleasure quarters of Japanese cities. And the pleasure quarters were exactly what you can imagine. There were places where you can drink wine, there were tea shops, there were kabuki performances, theater, and brothels. And the brothels were the main attraction of the pleasure quarters. So these were legal districts that were dedicated to these kind of pleasurable, pleasurable pursuits. And the ukiyo-e printmakers primarily took this subject matter from the pleasure quarters. Um, and of course, uh, Tokyo at this time was known as Edo. Um, and uh, these are two well-known uh, ukiyo-e printmakers, Kitagawa Utamaro, who specialized in beautiful women, um, and then Tori Kiyo, Kiyo no, Kiyonaga, sorry. Um, and all these prints are also from the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which has a very extensive Asian collection and a big collection of ukiyo-e prints. So usually these images are not just representing any woman doing laundry. They're, the Im implication is that they were either prostitutes or they were, um, um, uh, um, what do you call it, geishas. And uh, the, the long sort of columnar formatted prints, those are known as Hashira A format. It's a very specific proportion. The prints came in very specific measurements and proportions, and each format had a, a, a specific name. So the, yeah. Those are, they're like wooden clogs that are elevated on these two uh, thick sort of slabs of wood. So they keep the foot elevated from the ground. They said all the women are wearing shoes like that. If you look very carefully, even the women, like I'm going to point here. Here, you know, you're always, uh, there's the same kind of shoes. So there's sandals that are made of wood and they're elevated from the ground. 
And it's also typical of this kind of mincing walk that women had because they could fall off their feet very easily. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, Degas and the Impressionists and many 19th century Western artists were looking at and collecting Japanese prints. And they had a tremendous impact on modern art, these Japanese prints that came to the West, you know, after it was opened by uh, Admiral Perry in the 1850s, um, the West was flooded with Japanese products, uh, kimonos, uh, tea sets, you know, porcelains, um, you name it. And there was a craze for anything Japanese. It, was, it came to be known as Japanism. Before that, there was chinoiserie, right? So things coming from China uh, in trade with the West, but now all this material was coming from Japan and the artists were fascinated with the kind of unexpected views that Japanese printmakers used and also the flattening of forms and the linear uh, characteristics of these prints. So they started to uh, imitate those characteristics. Um, you know, Degas did this, Van Gogh, um, they were all very familiar and because the prints in particular were so inexpensive, they can even, uh, uh, an artist as poor as Van Gogh could actually afford to buy them because they were just like selling at centimes, you know, very, very low prices and brilliantly inventive and very graphically effective. So uh, also artists like Lautrec and Bonnard were interested in them and they influenced the way in which they made li their lithographs and posters. Um, so this is a, um, you see on the left, Bonnard's initial pencil sketch for this same print. And then the final print where you can see he eliminated um, the, the uh, figures in the upper right-hand corner of, of the, uh, the drawing. He kept the dog and then the gesture. Um, but what you also should be thinking about, it's a very charming print, but also consider the fact that this very, very little girl is doing very, very hard work. And remember that child labor was very ubiquitous all over the world and still is in a lot of, just like the laundry uh, done in the river. Um, you know, there's still a lot of child labor around the world. And this was very common in cities, including here in New York. Um, so again, you know, a lot of artists were motivated by some sense of social awareness and wanted to represent the labor that women uh, did. And this is a painting by Joseph Israels, who's a Dutch painter, uh, contemporary uh, uh, of, uh, of, I was gonna say, now I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing the names of some of the people I'm talking about, but um, he, he, he was a, uh, he lived until 1911. So he was a contemporary of the Impressionist, but he's a, an older artist. And then uh, in Russia, uh, before the Soviet revolution, there were a group of artists who were known as the Wanderers. And that included a group of, uh, these artists focused on the lives of the Russian peasant and working class people. So Abram Arkhipov uh, was among this group of artists. And these are two versions of a very similar composition dealing with the really the drudgery of uh, laundry. And you can see that these women, you know, some of whom are quite elderly, are uh, working in this steamy, uh, humid, probably very uncomfortable, very hot environment, um, and you know, doing this really, really tough labor. So Felix Valentin was one of the only, if not the only non-French painter who participated in a late 19th, early 20th century avant-garde group of painters that called themselves the Nabis, which was adapted from a Hebrew word for the prophets. And uh, he was Swiss, uh, although he was French Swiss, uh, and he came to Paris and 
uh, he worked with this group. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to say that they worked as a group, but they identified and showed together as a group. Uh, and that included artists like um, Edward Vuillard and uh, Bonard. In fact, there's a great exhibition of Bonard's later paintings now at the Aquavella Gallery. So it's a little plug. Um, anyway, so Valaton oh, was part of that group. And one of the things that are characteristic of Nabi's paintings is they were very interested in the lives of women. So they often depict the lives of women. Um, you know, we are lived with his mother who was a seamstress and he did a lot of paintings about uh, the work that his mother did. Uh, and Bernard painted his uh, life partner uh, in many of his paintings, those paintings of ba bathing scenes and erotic scenes. And uh, you saw that print of the little girl uh, with the basket of laundry. Um, and they tended to flatten forms out. Again, very influenced by the Japanese prints that were so common and beloved by these artists. So uh, Felix Valentin did this very interesting painting in 1899, which is a sort of an aerial view of a group of washerwomen uh, at the seashore and Etretat was on the seashore um, at the Atlantic. And um, he's turned their figures and the laundry on the beach into a kind of a pattern, you know? So it's a rather abstract painting. And this is something that all of the Nabi's painters were interested in, finding ways of kind of using forms to make pattern. A lot of their paintings are including um, like complicated wallpapers with women in pattern dresses. So one pattern is sort of embedded into another pattern. Sometimes it's even hard to make out where the figure ends and the background begins in some of their paintings. So uh, Valaton took a slightly different, um, you know, experimental turn with this painting where the figures themselves and the white bits of laundry become a sort of like a scattered pattern on the beach. And it takes a moment even to realize what's going on in the picture. It's something that's very typical of Nabi's paintings. Um, back in America, here in New York City, there were a group of artists who had studied with an artist named Robert Henry. Uh, and although Henry's name is actually, in French, it would be pronounced Henri, Henry wanted to identify as American. So he said, it should be pronounced Henry, not Henri. Uh, and he uh, taught at the Art Students League here in New York City. And he had a group of students who were very influenced by his philosophy of making art that's of the moment about ordinary life in the city. Um, and these artists came to be known as the Ashcan School because they painted urban reality. Um, so John French Sloan was one of these artists and um, this is a part of a group of works that he did representing women hanging laundry out to dry in an urban tenement. And I think most people know uh, Picasso's early work. Uh, it's also known as his blue period, where he was dealing a lot with drudgery and poverty and sadness, partly because he was experiencing that himself as a very young artist recently arrived in Paris. Um, but, you know, they, they were also very influenced by looking at Degas and Nabi's paintings and the art that was in Paris that he was exposed to. Um, so he also chose to represent women ironing. Um, but going beyond Paris, you know, a lot of artists were very interested in women working. And this is a work by, uh, on, on the left is a work by Rufino Tomayo, Mexican painter. Um, and the woman is brown skinned and she's got a, a little girl behind her. And this was part of this whole idea in Mexico, you know, following the Mexican revolution and independence and also, you know, um, there, it's 
this very contested relationship with America, with the United States of um, a kind of nationalistic school of painting that represented Mexicanness, Mexicanidad. Uh, it was like uh, almost an imperative for Mexican artists to represent indigenous women, uh, you know, going about their daily lives, uh, festivals, you know, Diego Rivera and many of his murals, he represented very specific um, festivals. Uh, it was really about being Mexican in, in the work. Uh, and Antonio Donghi was an Italian painter working during the fascist period in Italy. And in a way, like the Mexican painters, they were very interested in showing the daily lives of Italian people, uh, working class people, peasants. Um, so Donghi uh, often represented performers, uh, uh, like vaudeville performers, but he also did a lot of paintings about daily life of Italian people. Um, so this is a work by British artist Stanley Spencer. Now, Spencer was a kind of interesting character. I mean, all these artists are interesting characters, but Spencer in particular was somewhat of an eccentric. Um, although he, he studied in London, uh, even as a student, he was a commuting student. He went very, got up very early in the morning to commute to London from his hometown of Cookham. And when he was uh, an adult, he continued to live in this small village of Cookham, which he considered to be a paradise. And he sets a lot of his pictures in Cookham. However, during the First World War, he served in the British Army and uh, he was a very, very small guy, very, very petite. And um, I don't know that he ever saw any actual combat, but because he was a little guy and he was an, also an artist, he worked as a war artist and he documented uh, in a series of paintings, his experiences during the war. Um, and he did this in a very kind of unique way. I mean, he, he, he focused on the minutia of the, sir, the, the soldiers' lives rather than the sort of grand things. Like he never painted a battle scene. He painted uh, soldiers working on various projects. And uh, he was commissioned after the war by a wealthy family who lost a son to the war to uh, make a series of murals in a chapel. And this has come to be known as the Sandham Memorial Chapel in the town of Burclare in Hampshire, England. And he was inspired, um, Spencer that is, by the great fresco cycles of Giotto that are in uh, the Scrivani Chapel in Padua. Um, so he organized the walls very much the way Giotto organized them. But of course, Giotto's narrative is a New Testament narrative, starting with the golden legends of the life of the Virgin Mary, and then, you know, the life and passion of Christ, and then the vices and virtues in the predella around the base of the, um, of that chapel. So, like I said, um, Spencer, who did not work in fresco as Giotto did, he worked in oil on canvas, that was attached to the walls. He organized the space of the chapel based on that kind of tripartite division of the walls. But what he put on them were scenes of everyday life of the soldiers. Um, so one of those scenes is the sorting of laundry. So the woman, in, and I apologize that the quality of the larger image isn't that sharp. So I gave a detail that's sharper below that, just so that you can get a better idea of what the painting actually looks like. So um, remember, he's working from memory. He's not working with models, although he's a very masterful draftsman and you know could draw figures very realistically when he wanted to. He did a lot of portraits, which he rather hated doing. But anyway, uh, he really uh, did these paintings from memory. Um, so there are interesting distortions that are very typical and kind of unique to Stanley Spencer's paintings. Um, 
But anyway, the story is that the woman with the red hair is a nurse who's supervising the inventory of the laundry that's been washed and is now being folded and uh, so sorted by these soldiers. Um, so she's writing in a book, you know, the numbers and specific, like so many bed sheets, so many uh, blankets. The red pile is actually handkerchiefs that were only used for mental patients. Uh, so very, very specific. And um, Spencer kind of reveled in this kind of specificity in his work in general, but you can see that in these paintings for the uh, Memorial Chapel. Um, so everything has a specific meaning and a specific association. And I want to add that this is one of the first images I've shown you that show men involved in doing laundry. And the supervisor is the woman. Um, so now we get into a sort of darker aspect of laundry. And you know, think, thinking about you know, uh, uh, Spencer's paintings for this memorial chapel, which is, after all, about a war and about death. And uh, the central image, by the way, is a great resurrection of the soldiers. And there's a pile of white wooden crosses with men coming out of their graves, which is right behind the altar. That's the, uh, the main image in the Sandin Memorial Chapel. Uh, but this painting um, is a very different kind of laundry. It was done by a Scottish artist named Doris Zinkhuizen. I know her name doesn't sound Scottish, but her family went considerably back in Scotland. She was primarily known as a society portraitist and also she designed, she did fashion illustration and she had a career also associated with the theater with set design and costume design. But during World War II, she was asked to be a war artist. So there was a team of artists that were hired by the British government to document the war effort and also the immediate aftermath of the war. And this painting was done in the concentration camp, the Belsen concentration camp in April, 1945. And that IWM that's in the corner of the painting um, is a watermark from the Imperial War Museum. So it's in the collection of the Imperial War Museum. Um, that's not actually on the painting, but the the image I got was from that source. So they put their watermark on it. And um, the painting she entitled Human Laundry because she came to uh, Bergen Bay Belsen immediately after it was liberated. And um, there were many people still dying from malnutrition. Um, and the British um, rounded up the medical workers who were Nazi medical workers, and they forced them to wash, bathe, and um, prepare the inmates of the concentration camp who had survived so that they could be brought to a hospital. They were so frail that they couldn't be brought immediately to a hospital because they could have like typhus or some communicable disease. So this scene was something that Doris Sinkhuizen saw when she came to Belsen. She saw these German women who formerly had been nurses in, um, you know, and working to help eradicate the inmates of the concentration camp. Now they were forced to clean them and take care of them. Um, and some of the, the staff, you can also see one uh, doctor, the guy with the hat, uh, who would have been a Nazi doctor who's now treating these patients. So it's called human laundry, which is pretty chilling when you think about it. And other artists who have used laundry and things associated with laundry to really talk about political issues. Um, so uh, Samuel Joseph Brown was an African-American printmaker who made this uh, linoleum cut print uh, during the WPA, so in the 1930s. That was the Works Progress Administration set up by the Roosevelt administration to help alleviate the unemployment crisis during the Great Depression. And there was a very large uh, artist project 
that not only involved uh, painting murals in public spaces like post offices and hospitals and libraries, but also um, there was a printmaking division, there was an easel division, there was also um, uh, artists engaged in archiving and documenting American folk art. So there were many different branches to this and uh, Brown worked as a printmaker uh, and produced this, uh, this print of a, a girl carrying a bundle of laundry on her head. The other artist is contemporary artist, Willie Cole, who's used ironing boards and irons as a kind of metaphor to talk about African-American history. Uh, he sees a kind of a comparison to the shape of the slave ships in the forms of the irons and also the ironing boards. And uh, he actually makes sort of relief prints based on actual irons and ironing boards. And a lot of his um, grandmother, uh, aunts, uh, you know, members of his family worked as domestics. And of course, what a lot of uh, black domestics did was ironing and laundry. So these are a few more examples of work of his. Uh, five Beauties Rising is from a suite of five prints um, taken from actual um, ironing boards. And they're named after uh, some of his relatives who were domestics. So here's one is Lily and the other one is Jesse May. And then uh, Domestic Shield is an actual ironing board which has been scorched by an iron repeatedly suggesting these slave ships and also, you know, the activity of making, of working, you know, for white families. And uh, this is a painting by a contemporary, a very celebrated contemporary American painter, Kerry James Marshall. Um, and also I was very attracted to and I found it online because it was one of the few images of a man doing laundry and somewhat reminding me of Lily Martin Spencer's painting of the joyful laundress because he looks like he's really having a good time folding his laundry. Um, and Marshall does a lot of paintings of, you know, uh, African-American life, you know, very um, ordinary things that he kind of sacralizes in his paintings and monumentalizes them. Um, this is a work by Spanish painter, Antonio Lopez Garcia, so just soaking clothes. So Garcia is a realist painter, but he doesn't work from photographs. He works always from directly from the motif. He's a very, very meticulous, realistic painter, uh, paints all aspects of, he lives in Madrid, um, everything from the dirt in his garden to the grand avenues of Madrid to you know, these very intimate uh, scenes of um, laundry, the bathroom, paints a lot of dirt. And sort of uh, in a way like uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia, Catherine Murphy is American painter who also tends to focus on very mundane scenes, but seen from very unexpected points of view. So for example, this painting, it represents two red blankets hanging on a clothesline to dry, but there's a, uh, a gap between the blankets and you see some people uh, sitting on a yellow blanket on the grass, maybe having a picnic or just enjoying a beautiful summer day. Um, and you can also see the sunlight is hitting the blankets and you're seeing the shadows of leaves from the nearby trees projected on the blankets. So what ends up happening is that even though it's a hyper-realistic painting, it becomes very abstract. And this is something that Catherine Murphy does a lot in her work. Um, and going back to ironing. So um, David Moore is an artist I know very little about. I just happened to find this painting online. And I thought it'd be interesting to also have a Caribbean contemporary painter who's doing this, you know, very beautiful painting of a woman ironing with a, a girl in the background and a man seen through a window in the interior. Um, and given what the woman who or, or is not here anymore, what she said, it's interesting that the Caribbean was a place where 
upper class aristocrats would send their laundry. I'd have to corroborate that. I don't know what our source is for that. Um, anyway, so there's uh, also William H. Johnson, an American painter who went through many different stylistic evolutions in his career. He was a very, very fine, realistic painter. He went to Paris. Um, he married a Danish woman while he was there, and he um, was painting in a style very much influenced by the um, Russian uh, expressionist painter Chaim Soutine. I don't know that they ever actually met, but he, Johnson worked in the same village that Soutine had about a decade earlier and worked in this very uh, kind of expressionistic style, very, very reminiscent of Soutine. But when he came back to America, he started being more influenced by folk painting and the art of self-taught artists. And he developed this very kind of folkloric looking style. It was very flat uh, with big patches of color and very simplified figures. This is a contemporary uh, painter who, who uh, lives here in New York City. I think she's based in the Bronx, Dina Schutzer. Uh, and she did an entire series in 2017 uh, from a local laundromat where she went and just sketched and then did these uh, oil paintings from her sketches. I, I, I like the activity of the, you know, the, the way people are folding. A uh, woman is like considering the cost of doing laundry nowadays, even in a laundromat. The woman in the, in the yellow shirt in the lower left. And just a very kind of a fo photorealistic painting of a laundromat by Patricia Chidlow. Again, I don't know this artist personally, and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. And I wanted to really have a very, very contemporary image of laundry that we can all identify with. And I found this hyper-realistic or super-realistic sculpture by Dwayne Hansen, um, who uh, actually cast, the, these figures were made by casting directly from actual people. So they're not sculpted in a classical way, the way like Rodin would model the form um, or, or Renoir's laundress. These were actually cast. And then he used, um, you know, like um, I think um, fiberglass re and, and resins to make these figures. And then he very meticulously would paint them uh, and plant hair in them. And then there's real clothing. It's a real tied detergent box, a real plastic laundry basket with real laundry in it. Um, so there's very surprising because uh, people actually in museums have mistaken some of Hansen's paintings, uh, sculptures for actual people. And like he's done museum guards and people have gone up to the guard and said, oh, can you tell me how I find? And then they realize, oh, nothing's happening. <laughs> this is art. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm concluding with a contemporary artist who I met actually, a few months ago um, at a co-op gallery here in New York City at the First Street Gallery. Her name is Fabiola Gironi. She's Italian and she's uh, now, um, her husband's American and she has children. So she's like going back and forth between Milan and I think LA. Uh, and she's done an entire, really, I think very beautiful series of paintings about laundry. And she's a young mother. So, you know, something that she's gonna do a lot of. Uh, of course, luckily she has a nice washing machine. Uh, but you know, lots of different aspects of laundry, the, the laundry sort of piling out of the machine. She's also done a series of paintings of laundry drying on drying racks, which are very common in Italy. Um, I think they're called tendini. And uh, one really interesting painting that was inspired by laundry uh, is this, which is my last image for this presentation. Um, and what's interesting about it is it's actually an exercise. Uh, so you see an, uh, an iron, you see rubber gloves, you see detergent, you see all, the, they, all the, the, the stuff involved in doing laundry, but it was inspired by this painting by 
the Renaissance master um, Paolo Veronese, and that's why it's called After Veronese, the Martyrdom of Saint Justina. Oh, I just realized martyrdom is spelled wrong there. I'm sorry about that. I didn't catch that. But anyway, um, so that painting is in Padua at the Museo Civico, Civic Museum. It was painted in 1556. And I just want you to look at a, a, a while at the, the inset of the Veronese and see the correspondences. It's really quite a brilliant exercise in taking this very grand subject matter from a very large painting and sort of transposing it almost one for one into this very mundane still life of, um, I mean, not artistically mundane, but the activity um, is very mundane. Uh, you know, so like you can actually see the color you know, where she's used the same color and very similar, if not identical shapes and transpose them from figures to bottles, um, you know, iron, um, even the architecture, that column becomes a crate, the side of a crate. Uh, there's a column in the distance uh, of like a ruin and you can see that's been turned into a, what looks like a thermos. So it's really a kind of a brilliant, uh, transformation and an homage to, you know, this great artist of the past. So um, that's, it 